All right. So, hi, my name is Tanya Dapke, and if you don't know, I'm an entomologist at the Academy of Natural Sciences. What that means is I look at insects under microscopes that we've taken out of freshwater streams and ponds and lakes and rivers, um, and we identify them to um, species if we can, usually we can't, but we identify them to the as much as we can. And what that does is it helps us figure out whether or not the stream is healthy or sick. Because what you find in a stream, what it is, how many different kinds of things there is, can tell us a lot about stream health. And I'm also joined by... Hi. My name is Danielle Odom, and I also work at the Patrick Center for Environmental Research at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, similarly, I work largely in the labs and in the field, um, collecting macroinvertebrate specimens and processing them in the lab all the way up to data entry. Um, and yeah, I actually specialize in one particular family, um, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail later. Yep. All right. So I'm going to do something uh, that's probably not what you guys are used to, and that's a PowerPoint. And the reason that I'm doing this is that we really want you to see how cool these insects are. And really the only way I can do that is to have some really beautiful high res images and videos playing on your screen. So I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see a PowerPoint. Okay. There we go. So we like to think that freshwater macroinvertebrates are the coolest insects out there. We're super biased, we know, but um, if you look at this picture, this is a little damselfly. It's purple. We found this guy in May. He just landed right there on my waders, and we'll tell you what waders are in a minute. Um, and we just love being out there in freshwater places because you can always find something new and there's a lot of diversity. So who we are. So we just give you a quick introduction to who we are, but here's our pictures. This is us in the field. This is us in places looking for those bugs. And so what are we using? looks like some nets and I'm scrubbing rocks. It looks like a, a, one of those scrub brushes that you use to clean your tub. Um, why do we study freshwater insects? So I kind of talked a little bit about this in the intro, but the reason why we study freshwater macroinvertebrates is because they're really good bioindicators. And that's a big word, right? So a bioindicator is a biological, like some type of organism like plants or algae or insects. Um, that we can study in environments and habitats like freshwater streams or deserts or forests. And instead of looking at the whole forest, we just look at one little kind of set of organisms. And for us, that's macroinvertebrates. And when we study the macroinvertebrates, how many there are, what different kinds there are, we can learn a lot about that ecosystem because they're living in an ecosystem and they are able to, um, they react to changes in the environment. So if somebody dumps some pollution or lots of organic materials, those macroinvertebrates can either survive or not survive. And so when we look at them, uh, whether or not they're there and why we can figure out whether or not those streams are healthy or sick. Um, so here's another slide that just kind of tells you a little bit more about that. We collect the bugs in the water and who we find tells us a lot about the water. If the water is clean, we find lots of different kinds of bugs. But if the water's dirty, we don't find as, as many bugs. And this first little circle picture here, you see Danielle, and she's using something called a D-net. And what she'll do is she'll take that net and she'll scoop the bugs out of the water. And it sounds kind of hard, but what she does is she'll like, in the water, she'll scrub the rocks with her foot and then she'll quickly move the net through all that detritus. Or she'll go up to those uh, grasses there and she'll shake the grasses with the net and sometimes you can get some insects to fall into your net. The second picture is a type of insect that we find. This one's called a helgramite. This is a really, really small helgramite. They can get really big and scary and those jaws are so sharp. They can actually really hurt you. Um, some fishermen will use these bugs for bait. The second picture, or the third picture, sorry, is a caddisfly, and it doesn't really look like anything, does it? It kind of looks like a stick, and that's the whole point. Caddisflies are really uh, innovative animals because they make their own houses and they carry it around with them. And then the last picture is called a water scorpion. It's actually a bug, and this bug eats other bugs in the water, and they will bite you, so be careful if you ever see one. If I may, I wanted to point out that the background in my stream right now, I don't know if you can see this, is a D-net in action. So you've got the boot um, from the waders and this person that's sampling here is gently 
kicking the rocks and letting the specimens travel right into the DNet frame. Yeah, very cool. Um, so that follows right into how do we find freshwater macroinvertebrates. So this is me in a place called Cobbs Creek. And if you're from Delaware County, you probably know where Cobbs Creek is. And some of the things you can see also are some trash, which is kind of sad. We do see um, people just dumping their trash into water. And this affects those macroinvertebrates. And we can see that when we don't find as many as we want to. I have something called a server sampler. And what that does is I sit in the stream and the water is coming towards me. And as the water comes towards me, that flows through that server sampler and that has a net on the other side. And it collects everything that I scrub off of those rocks as it, the water flows through it. And real quick, we wanted to show you a fun video. Um, this is something that I, we found on the internet where um, this person put insects and other types of macroinvertebrates. So macroinvertebrates can mean anything. It can mean an insect, it can be um, like clams or mussels um, or even worms. So you're gonna learn more about this. Let's watch this video real quick. When we look through a microscope, life in the micro world can look quite strange and unfamiliar. But some organisms look even more alien when viewed with polarized light. This gives That's us a, a Daphnia. display of colors and make hidden details visible. Due Those to are midges. Called pyrophringens, That's a copepod. Observe the tiny animals in the whole world. Ostracods. So let's look at life in a different light. One type of organism that reacts well to the polarized light is insect larvae. This is because the exoskeleton of these animals is made of a pyrophringian polymer called chitin. As the larvae move, each individual body segment gets aligned differently in the polarized light, which make it look like the segments are changing colors. This one is the larva of a lake fly. You can even see what he's space. eating inside his belly there. Here I have adjusted the light to highlight the individual muscle strengths inside of the animal. Each muscle fiber can be seen as a white line inside of the larva, and when it moves, the strands flicker because the birefringent properties and the orientation of the fibers change. And this is this a mayfly. It's a mayfly. Yeah. And if you look closely, you're able to see that each leg contains two strands of muscle. One to move the knee joint in one direction, and one to move it in the other direction. This is very similar to the way our joints work. And you can even see his gills Other moving here. Look beautiful and alien like in polar and slight are crustaceans. This one is a marine copepod, and the clusters attached to his tail are egg cells. When these eggs hatch, the newborn babies are called nauplius. And if you didn't know it, you wouldn't think that the nauplius and the adult copepods were from the same species, as they can look very different. A very common type of crustacean in ponds and lakes are water flies. As you can see, the water flea has an empty space in the back of its shell. This cavity is for carrying eggs as well as newborn water flies. This one has two eggs under her shell. They will stay there until a couple of days after they hatch as protection from predators. These ones are called ostracots. Ostracots vary greatly in size between species, from around 200 microns to about 3 centimeters. Still really small. Another thing that varies between species is what they feed on. Some are carnivores, others are herbivores, and some are scavengers or filter feeders. This one is a quite large species, and as a snack, it has found a big and juicy chunk of a dead worm to nibble. Here, you are able to see the individual muscle fibers of an ostracot in action as they pull the knee joint in one direction and in the other direction. This tie grid would be completely transparent in normal light. But in polarized light, the otherwise hidden muscle fibers get visible. So, if you didn't understand, I mean, said tardigrade. Those are water bears. These are part of its mouth. 
and it uses them to pierce cells or animals when it feeds. The reason why it looks like the tardigrade has swallowed a bunch of microscopic fireflies is due to the presence of ingested biorefringent particles in its stomach. This cute little fellow is a larva of a marine snake, or a villager of a gastropod if you're fancy. The rapid beating hair-like projections are called cilia, and the animal uses them to swim and to feed. If you look closely, you're able to see food particles being swirled around inside of the stomach, which aids in the digestion. You're also able to see a beating heart inside of the animal. At some point, the villager undergoes metamorphosis, where it loses its cilia and becomes bound to move like a snail. Annelid worms shine brightly in polarized light because they are essentially a tube of muscles filled with blood vessels and a digestive tract. Here, you are able to see how the worm moves its blood around. Some, but not all worms, use these peristaltic movements to squeeze blood through their blood vessels. Just like the movements that squeezes your food from your stomach to the exit. Another thing that looks incredibly beautiful and trivial in polarized light is crystal growth. Here, it's vitamin C, but you will save Okay, that. so that's it for this video. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about some of our favorite types of macroinvertebrates. Um, I just put these three up here because they're the ones that I personally like the best. Um, and then Danielle's going to talk about her favorites, which are midges. And so the first picture there, this is our little mascot. His name is Rocky and he's a crayfish. And you're going to meet him in a little bit after we stop the PowerPoint. Um, and then this is a mayfly and they're called flat-headed mayflies. They're the coolest mayflies. But you can see like his head right here. And there's his eyes. And these are his gills on the side. That's how he breathes in the water. And then this one here is a beautiful blue dragonfly. I love dragonflies. Um, so first we're going to talk about mayflies real quick. And this, the important thing to know is that um, mayflies don't really live that long. And that kind of is reflected in their Latin name, which is pronounced ephemeroptera. And it means short-lived. Because these animals, when they become adults, they live most of their lives as babies you know, and young ones under the water. And then when they come out to be adults to lay their eggs, they only live for like maybe a day to a couple days and then they die. So um, they're really a short lived type of insect and that's what that kind of means. What do they eat? Well, they eat lots of different kinds of things. Um, they can eat algae off of rocks. Um, I don't know if any of them are predators. They think they might be. Um, and let's see how fast these baby mayflies hatch. So I'm going to start at the video and you're going to see her lay some eggs. So here she goes. She's going to lay some eggs and we're at one second, right? So I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. Let's go. Let's see. 30 seconds. Have they hatched yet? Still only 30 seconds. Let's see. Let's go 52 seconds. Do you see some movement down there? Oh, I see some movement. It takes them less than a minute from the time that she lays those eggs for those babies to come out. Look at all those babies. Aren't they cute? They're really, really small too. I think that's another important thing to note is that insects go through lots of different size changes and life stages. And all that means is every time they, as they grow up, they, they, uh, they molt, they change their skin. And you can kind of see this like in the summertime when you see cicada skins on the trees. And that's because the cicada has um, shed its skin, it's come out because it's ready to get bigger and to change its form. And all insects do this, and it's just some other kind. And don't worry, you'll have links to all these videos that you can watch at home. Um, let's see what else we can talk about. So here's our crayfish. This is Rocky. We're going to give Rocky a pee after we're all done this um, uh, PowerPoint. Now, Rocky only gets one vegetable a week. Do you eat your vegetables every day? I sure hope so. But he only gets a vegetable once a week. Most of the time, he's eating more of a protein-based diet. He has two big claws. Look at his big claws. And he does live in a pineapple under the sea because he doesn't like to have light come down on him. He likes to be in dark places. So he kind of looks like a mini lobster, doesn't he? And here's what it would look like if uh, when he gets bigger. So this is a bigger type of crayfish. And you can see 
there's a couple things that are really cool about this video. But first you can see this is him crawling forward and there's other things moving around. So look, that's like a little mayfly there. Look, 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 right there. And what's over here? This is a crane fly larva. There's a stone fly larva. There's another mayfly. Wow, look at all these different kinds of insects in here. So exciting. There's that heptagenead mayfly. This is what it looks like when it's alive. Very cool. Oh, what's that? It's stepping over everybody. There's one other thing I saw. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Right there. Does that look like a rock to you? It's not. It's called a water penny. Oh, this piece of thing of, of leaves is in the way, but that little circle there, that's a water penny. Water pennies are baby beetles. Okay. Um, now let's talk about caddisflies. This is the cutest caddisfly I've ever seen. Remember we talked about caddisflies and caddisflies actually build their homes around them. And one of the reasons that they do this is because they camouflage themselves. They have really fleshy bodies. Most of the insects in the water have really hard exoskeletons all over, but not caddisflies. Caddisflies have a really squishy um, belly. So in order to keep themselves safe, they'll take everything that they can find in the river around them, like small rocks, twigs, leaves, grass. They build the most amazing cases. And so let's watch how they do that here. They're related to caterpillars, which are turned into butterflies and moths, and they can also build um, silk cocoons and cases. So let's go into the water and we can see how they do this. So there he is right there. Watch him come out. Oh, so cute. And look at this case he's made. How perfect it is. He likes to dig in the dirt there. Watch him go. And there he is, totally hidden and safe. Now you can see him gluing the two rocks together. And he uses this by the silk spinnerets in his mouth. I don't know how the silk can dry and hold to things together under the water. That's not a question I can answer, but I know it works. And you see how this case is a little different. The rocks are bigger this time. So this is a different kind of caddisfly. Each caddisfly makes its own kind of house. Oh, somebody caught him anyway. That's a shame. But you can see how he kind of almost looks like a worm. He's super tasty. So he's got to stay hidden. All right, what's next? Um, oh, so really good, uh, interesting thing that some people have done is they rear caddisflies. And what they do is instead of having the caddisflies live in a little section with just rocks and twigs, they give them really shiny, beautiful stones and rocks. And these, this piece of jewelry right here, the caddisfly made this. This was a caddisfly case. And they let the caddisflies just do their thing. And when the caddisfly leaves that case, when it's all done and ready to grow up, they take the case and it looks like they've sealed it in some type of sealant and they put it on an earring. And you can see the caddisfly here in a really pretty purple one. I kind of want that one. Purple's my favorite color. Um, in case your parents want to find you uh, some type of jewelry, these are two shops that I found online where you can get those pieces of jewelry. So another one of my favorite kinds of insects is a dragonfly. The, um, this has some really cool slow motion uh, video, so let's watch it real quick. This pea shooter might be low tech, but it's the perfect tool to recreate a high speed target for our dragonfly. Watch his head fires noise. out seeds so quickly, our eyes can't possibly see them. But is the dragonfly's vision quick enough to spot it? Wow. We're gonna have a look back at our slow motion clip. Will the dragonfly detect the tiny pea? The dragonfly is completely still. And the head definitely turns before we see the seed come into frame. And then the dragonfly almost takes. Okay. So I just think that's so, oops, here we go. I think it's so cool. Plus it was this beautiful red color. There's so many amazing colors. Now, this is what they look like when they're babies because we just saw a dragonfly and it wasn't living in the water. But as babies, they do live in the water. 
So this right here is a baby dragonfly, and this right here is a baby damselfly. They're both the same uh, type of insects. They're both odonata, but dragonflies hold their wings out, and damselflies hold their wings behind their back, like that first picture that we saw on the slideshow. Um, and these are one of our favorites. We want to turn these guys into little plushies. They're called springtails. Um, and if you ever get a chance to watch Life in the Undergrowth with David Attenborough, you can learn about all sorts of really cool insects. But this is a little segment that is from Life in the Undergrowth with David Attenborough. Tell this pink will give you an idea of why they're tiny. This minute little creature is a spring. It's less than half a millimeter long, the size of a full stock. In one square meter of soil, there may be over 10,000 of them. Drying out is a very real danger for them, and some waterproof themselves regularly with a droplet of special grooming fluid. You might even say that they have turned bathing into an art form. They even have two inflatable tubes that enable them to get to those hard to reach places. To help them get around through the leaf litter, these spring towns, as their name suggests, have a rather novel way of jumping. They have a tiny two pronged lever beneath their abdomen. One small flick from it can catapult them six inches, some 15 centimeters, into the air. It's the equivalent of a human being jumping over the Eiffel Tower. Wow, I don't think I could jump over the Eiffel Tower. This seems really tall. <laughs> all right, Danielle, tell us all about Chironomidae. Sure. So most of what we process in the lab, all of our little insects, we can do with a microscope called the dissection microscope. But some of them are so small that I need to use what's called a compound microscope, which you can see in the photograph on the right. That was me yesterday, actually. Um, so what I have to do is I have to put these insects, they're called chironomidae, which the common name is midge. Um, I put them on the slides, as you see in photograph on the left, and I use the microscope to examine their head capsules, which you can see in the next slide. So they're called non-biting midges. They're very similar to mosquitoes. And in fact, Chironomidae, the name of the family, um, translates loosely to mean the pantomimist or one who mimics another insect because they look very similar to mosquito larvae. And as adults, they also look quite similar to mosquitoes. Um, and as you can see in these head capsule photos, um, some of them actually eat other midges. So the cursor right now is circling the head capsule of another specimen. So that does occasionally happen, but in the photo on the right, if you look really closely, there's something that kind of looks like fans on the side of the mouth. That is so that they can filter feed because they largely feed on um, algae and detritus in the stream or all the detritus is a fancy word to mean like kind of trash litter, like little bits of particles. Um, yeah, so that's what I spend a fair amount of my time in the lab doing is looking at these types of creatures under the microscope and trying to figure out what they are because they all have different tolerances to pollution in the water. And what can stream diversity tell us? So we have two pictures here. And on the left side, right here, we have a picture of a midge, which Danielle just talked about, a type of snail, a worm, and some scuds. But on this picture on the right, we have dragonflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, another type of stonefly, different kinds, 
Um, these might be <laughs> maple. They're, <laughs> they're very <laughs> tiny. <laughs> Here's some water pennies. These are, um, I think this is a black fly. This looks like, uh, these are definitely mayflies. These are different kind of mayflies. Here's some midges. Here's some different kind of flies. Here's some different types of snails. There's lots of different kinds of things here. So and if I may, in sure. that photo, you can see why I need to put my specimens on yeah. a slide. Cause look how small those midges are compared to everything else in that photograph. They're very tiny. Good point, Danielle, good point. Um, and so what we want to emphasize here is that diversity is better. Diversity means that your environment is healthier. We wanna see different types of insects. We wanna see as many different kinds of insects as we can, because then we know the stream is healthy. But if it's not healthy, our jobs are really boring. We only see a couple different kinds of things. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for now. Um, give me one second, I gotta exit out. Okay, all right, so real quick, I'm gonna go to the video and see if there are any questions. Um, and while I'm doing that, do you have any fun facts you wanna share, Danielle? Um, sure, actually a lot of the fun facts I happen to, to know are about dragonflies. They are a very popular, um, they're very popular amongst the macroinvertebrates, and it happens to be the mascot of the academy. Um, so what I know about dragonflies are they surprisingly are the best hunters in the entire animal kingdom. Nine and a half times out of ten, they can successfully trap and kill the prey that they are chasing after. And this is true for both the larval stage and the adult stage. And the reason for that is because of their trap-like mouth. So most of the audience, the targeted audience is probably too young to see this film, but the movies Alien are designed off of the dragonfly. The mouthpiece actually kind of opens like this and pulls the prey into their mouth. Um, and that's actually what odonata means. It means, uh, I believe it's large tooth or it's something to do with that particular mouth part. Um, so that is what I know about dragonflies. I know a few more things if anybody wants to hear another pretty cool fact. I think the other cool fact about, fact about dragonflies is they move around in the water by shooting water out their butts. I think that's mm -hmm. great. It's just such a fun way to move around. You know, imagine if you could just like fart your way down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> um, I guess I'll share the one other fact that I know, and I think this is really cool. Um, back in prehistoric times, a long, long time ago, um, the air had way more oxygen in it than it does now. And that allowed a lot of species to be quite larger than they currently are. So dragonflies used to be about a foot long with a wingspan of about 16 inches. So they were about the size of a woolly, uh, pileated woodpecker, um, which to me is kind of terrifying to think about. Um, I wish I could see it, but that's like a giant, giant dragonfly. Um, with that scary mouth part just going around eating other insects. So that's pretty cool too. Yeah, I agree. Um, so if you wanna see more pictures of freshwater insects, all you have to do is check out this event page and I'll be posting a couple links where you guys can just you know, move around these pictures and get really close up and see what they look like. And maybe we can post that, um, that other website where you can practice rough sorting. Um, and what rough sorting is, is after we collect everything in those nets, we have to dump it all out into trays and like pick out the macro invertebrates. Um, and so we found a place online where you can practice that too if you'd like. Um, but I think for now, that's it. I don't see any questions and you can always write to us later and ask us questions. We're here all the time. You can find us on Facebook um, and hopefully this will be helpful for anyone in the future and you can watch it at another time. So thanks everybody. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for coming.
is 